aftermath of that winter storm that slammed the D.C. area, hundreds of cars stuck overnight on I-95. This video shows the extent of the traffic, which was so bad it took Senator Tim Kaine 26 hours just to get from Richmond, Virginia to the U.S. Capitol. He did not arrive until this afternoon. Today, officials confirmed dozens of abandoned cars remain on the road. And tonight, we're tracking the new winter blast making its way across the country. 20 states from California to Michigan now under winter alerts facing heavy snow, brutal cold, and high winds. One storm possibly heading for the northeast. Andrew Z is timing it all out for us. Tonight, the staggering pandemic milestone. The U.S. reporting more than 1 million infections in 24 hours after a holiday backlog of testing. That's the highest number reported by any country in a single day since the start of the pandemic. The Omicron variant now accounts for 95% of all new cases in the U.S. Tonight, the courtroom battle involving Prince Andrew is unfolding right here in New York. Prince Andrew's attorneys are arguing to dismiss an alleged sex assault lawsuit filed by Virginia Giuffre, claiming her 2009 settlement with Jeffrey Epstein prevents her from suing Prince Andrew because it cleared other potential defendants, including royals. We are two days away now from one year since the January 6th riot, and tonight the major headline from the House January 6th investigation over the assault on the Capitol. The House committee is preparing to ask Fox News host Sean Hannity to cooperate with its investigation and testify about texts that he sent to former President Trump's former chief of staff, Mark Meadows. And meet a family still divided after a son turned his father in in the days after the Capitol riot. I also bear that guilt too pretty much tear this family apart and it sucks but i can't do much about it you feel responsible for it absolutely now with dad awaiting trial for his alleged involvement in january 6th a report on how this family is trying to slowly begin the process of healing Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with that standstill on an American highway for more than 24 hours and the hundreds of drivers stranded in snow and ice. Both sides of an icy Interstate 95 in Virginia were completely blocked after that major snowstorm moved through on Monday. A number of big rigs jackknifed in deep snow. Drivers were forced to spend the night with temperatures plunging below zero, leaving people without heat and food, some running out of gas, others abandoning their cars altogether. But the majority, including Senator Tim Kaine, waited until morning when they were finally able to start that slow journey to their desired destinations. But questions remain tonight about why the roads were not prepped better ahead of time for the snow and ice. And it wasn't just the roads. An Amtrak train with 200 passengers traveling from New Orleans to New York was forced to stop in Lynchburg, Virginia, for more than 24 hours. And now tonight, new winter storms are on the way. Ginger Z will have the forecast in just a moment. But first, Kenneth Milton leads us off. From Virginia. Tonight, more than 27 hours into this nightmare on I-95, there are still cars abandoned on the highway after hundreds of drivers, families stranded all night. Vehicles starting to run out of gas. Food, water is an issue for some of these people. It started with multiple tractor trailers jackknifing near Fredericksburg, Virginia, as temperatures plummeted below freezing. Travelers like Kimberly Gibson and her family desperate for information. Our cell phones don't work. Um, internet goes in and out. So it's we've just been sitting here. The Virginia Department of Transportation calling the situation unprecedented. Been in this spot for seven hours, almost eight hours. Even Virginia Senator Tim Kaine was stuck. His staff tweeting he was back at the Capitol after 27 hours. This is my daughter next to me having what's left of our snack stash. Jennifer Travis and her family able to get off the interstate, only to get stuck along an alternate route. We can't get out. All of the side streets are congested. Um, everything is red. Uh, we're tired. We're exhausted. We have been on the road since 2 o'clock in the afternoon yesterday. Forecasters predicted up to a foot of snow in the region, and the first major winter storm of the season delivered. We were not able to pre-treat our roadways before, before, and this is due to the rain. The rain would have washed all of our chemicals and salt off the road. And it wasn't just cars. An Amtrak train from New Orleans to New York stranded in Lynchburg, resuming its journey late today. Kenneth Moten joins us now from Virginia. Kenneth, what happened here? What are officials saying about why the roads were not better prepared for the snow and ice? 
Well, Lindsay, state officials were pressed on that today. They say if they would have pre-treated those roads, put down salt, they believe the rain would have washed it away by the time that massive storm dumped so much snow on this area. They say they were overwhelmed by the snow, but they said this was all unfortunate and that this was unacceptable as well. But they also say under that snow was a thick layer of ice, four inches of ice. At one point, Lindsay, they had 30 troopers out on I-95 checking on stranded drivers, but officials do insist that stretch of the highway of that major interstate will be reopened by the morning rush. But I must tell you and report, there is freezing rain in the forecast, Lindsay. Kenneth Moulton, our thanks to you. And let's get right to Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z, who is tracking the new winter threats now moving across the country tonight. Hey, Ginger. Hey there, Lindsay. It's going to be hard for a lot of folks in the mid-Atlantic and Northeast this week because it'll feel like you can barely catch your breath between storms. So I'll start you off with what's happening from where I'm standing up to Maine, back to Richmond, Virginia tomorrow morning. We're going to see rain fall, but onto freezing surfaces. And so that will make freezing rain like those ice rinks. That's why you see anywhere from Richmond up to Lewiston, Maine, a uh, winter weather advisory. Now that's not even a full on storm. We've got two other storms we're going to be watching. That is also why you see tons of alerts all the way from Michigan and Ohio back to Oregon and Washington State. Those, you know, wind chill alerts go all the way into the Texas panhandle. So that one low that you see that's kind of bringing snow blizzard conditions to eastern North Dakota, South Dakota, western Minnesota, that one's going to move through the northern Great Lakes. But it's that next one that we'll be watching for the Rockies and that it's going to kind of connect to the cold front on the bottom and another Arctic blast comes behind this. But what it will do is ride up along that front and the Gulf Coast and by Friday morning, everybody that just got hit could see more snow from Norfolk right up through Richmond, Washington, D.C., Fredericksburg, Delaware, up to New Jersey. This time it looks like it would not miss New York and Boston. And so we will keep updating how much snow to anticipate. But I just will tell you right now that pre-treating the roads before Friday morning would likely be a great idea. A good idea, and we can perhaps learn from the storm that just passed, but we see those alerts, warnings, advisories all over the map, just getting ready for this winter wallop. Ginger, thank you. Tonight, the CDC has clarified its isolation guidelines amid growing backlash, but has yet again not made a testing requirement for those who test positive and then isolate for five days. This is President Biden earlier today said some will needlessly die for choosing to stay unvaccinated. ABC's Matt Gutman has this report. Tonight, the CDC under growing scrutiny for recommending that people infected with COVID end isolation after five days without a test now giving new guidance yet again for Americans who can and want to test. If it's positive, isolate another five days. If negative, leave isolation, but wear a mask until day 10 and avoid high-risk activity. Right, the CDC so says a negative rapid test does not guarantee you can't spread the virus. This is all about the fact that there's just not enough tests. They do work to identify contagiousness. The reality is if every American had access to, say, five tests at home, we really wouldn't be having this conversation. Omicron is now estimated to make up 95% of new cases in the U.S. And today, the president telling unvaccinated Americans they have reason to be alarmed. Some will die, needlessly die. Unvaccinated are taking up hospital beds and crowding emergency rooms and intensive care units. And the president today announcing that he was doubling the purchase of Pfizer's COVID-19 antiviral pill from 10 million to 20 million treatments. But the majority of those treatments won't arrive until well after the latest models suggest Omicron begins to resolve in March. That comes as a record 1 million COVID cases was reported just yesterday, driven by a holiday backlog and skyrocketing demand for testing. And across the country, long lines and for some, longer waits for lab results. Right now, if you want a PCR test, it's like a week wait because they don't have enough equipment for testing. In Los Angeles, the country's second largest school system, parents are now scrambling to get their kids tested after the district ordered mandatory testing before a return to the classroom next week. Is it hard to find tests outside of like the ones that are offered by the school? We have um, one of our hospitals Kaiser, um, but my sister got tested there, but it took her five days to get her results. Those at-home tests in short supply. California's governor promised to deliver six million kits, but many families are still waiting, and some schools are opening without them. The state blaming winter storms for shipping delays. In Boston today, more than a thousand teachers and staff out. 
we are getting to a point where that is a tremendous strain on every classroom, on every school. And across the country, more than 3,500 schools have gone to remote learning or delayed a return to in-person classes. And 30 million eligible children have yet to get a vaccine. And the number of children going into hospitals quadrupling over the last month. We have staggering numbers here during this Omicron surge already. It seems that almost exclusively we're caring for unvaccinated adolescents. 17-year-old Haley Mullinax was unvaccinated and is now fighting for her life on a ventilator. She delivered her first child, a girl, by C-section, but has not been able to meet her. She has never seen her baby girl, and she's never touched her. And it, that, that is heartbreaking. That's tough. And I cannot wait to see my baby girl holding her baby girl. Heartbreaking just to hear about that scenario, one of so many. Matt Gutman joins us now. Matt, the White House promised to send out half a billion at-home testing kits starting this month. When will people get those? And there's word tonight that Walmart and Kroger are actually raising prices on those tests. Now, Lindsay, just before Christmas, the president said he hopes to begin shipping out those 500 million test kits to people's homes by the end of this month. Now the White House seems to be shifting that timeline somewhat, saying that they only hope to receive those test kits by the end of this month. As for those at-home rapid test kits, uh, Walmart and Kroger had a three-month deal with the federal government to sell those test kits at $14 each. That has now lapsed, and they are raising the price by as much as $10 on each of those kits. Lindsay. Wow, significant increase there. Matt Gutman, our thanks to you. Now let's talk about one of the biggest stressors that parents are facing right now. I have to include myself in this, talking, of course, about children and schools. Joining us now is Dallas Superintendent Michael Hinojosa. Superintendent, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. So your school district is made up of 6.5 million people, the second largest in your state. As a result of the Omicron variant spread, you've decided to continue your mask and quarantine protocols. How long do you plan on keeping the mandate, and, and how receptive have the parents and faculty been to it? Well, we had hoped that by Martin Luther King Day, we could make it the protocol optional, but that is no longer possible. The data, we're now in code red in Dallas County, uh, and the cases have risen significantly. So we are going to now defer that decision until the end of spring break. And um, we'll evaluate the data at the time, and we'll make the best decision possible. Safety for our students is the number one uh, chore that we have, and uh, learning is the second one. And we, we're going to try to combine both. And so we've had to make some tough decisions. To answer your question, most people have been very supportive of my decision, uh, including the school board and the parents. We've had a few people that are frustrated by it, but very few that have been vocal about our decision to keep the mandate through spring break. How concerned are you, given the number of children getting COVID, about the possibility of children having to go entirely remotely, uh, virtually? Well, we, that's going to be our last, 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 last resort. If we have a problem on a campus, we'll shut down an individual campus. In fact, over the last two years, we've only shut down two campuses for four days at a time because we couldn't staff them. So we'll do whatever it takes to keep the schools open. We've learned that only 4% of our students do well in virtual instruction. Now, we have provided an option for some parents. We have about 900 parents that have chosen that route. But you have to have some kind of success in the virtual environment to be qualified to be entering in those schools. So our people have been compliant, our teachers have been compliant, our students have been compliant, they understand the dangers, and somehow we're managing. I was on a call with all the national superintendents just an hour ago, and many of them are having huge staffing issues that we are very fortunate not to have at this time. And the mask mandate has been a, a big of a bit of a tug of war between schools and Governor Abbott. Have you heard yet from the governor's office about how they plan to support both the school system as well as keeping students safe? Well, we have not heard at all from the governor this, during this entire period. We're, we're working through the courts, and right now we're prevailing at a court of appeals. And so we have not heard, and we're going to continue doing what's in the best interest of our students until uh, some court tells us we can no longer do that, make our own local decision. I'm proud of everyone for ste uh, stepping up, and uh, we have a, a, an outstanding legal team. And so far, we think we're on the right side of history and that we will prevail in this decision to keep everyone safe.
And lastly, we're just one week into 2022, but your school district is already offering a retention incentive to teachers, which could amount to $3,500. Uh, really, two questions here, I guess. Is that enough? And also, how is the morale of the teachers two years after this pandemic? Well, I'll be honest with you. The teachers are tired, and they've, they've had it, but they are warriors. They've really stepped up. We are one very fortunate that our turnover rate is actually lower than anybody in our county. Uh, we are offering an incentive to our best teachers to stay, to come back the following year, and we're getting a pretty good reception. Some of them wanted it right now, but the goal of retention is to keep our best teachers year after year. And so we felt that that was a good way, a good investment of our ESSER dollars to keep our most talented teachers in front of our students with the greatest needs. And it's been very uh, positive a response so far. And just one more for you, Superintendent, if I might. What do you say to parents who are looking at their kids sitting in front of the computers or are paying attention sometimes and, and distracted others uh, who say that, look, the, this just doesn't replace that in-class education. The children are, are just way uh, losing too much at this point. I, Lindsay, I agree with those parents 100%. We have data that shows only three to four percent of our students do well in that environment and those students usually have two parents who are there with them so i agree with them and that's why we have to do everything to keep the students safe and they need to be in school and i'm proud of everyone who is muscled up to help us uh, stay on that journey up to this point wow three to four percent that's really a startling number there dallas superintendent michael Inojosa, we thank you so much for your time i appreciate it thank you lindsay as we approach one year since the January 6th attack, the House Select Committee is now preparing to ask Fox News host Sean Hannity to voluntarily cooperate in their investigation as the committee reveals the details of text messages between Hannity and former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows and others ahead of the siege. ABC News Chief Washington correspondent Jonathan Carl has the details. Tonight, the House January 6th committee is asking to speak to Fox News host Sean Hannity, describing him as a de facto advisor to former President Donald Trump. The committee already has dozens of text messages Hannity exchanged with former Chief of Staff Mark Meadows and others. On December 31st, a week before the insurrection, Hannity seemed to warn Meadows that top lawyers at the White House were on the verge of resigning en masse to protest Trump's plans to overturn the election. He texted, quote, we can't lose the entire White House counsel's office. I do not see January 6th happening the way he is being told. On January 5th, the day before the insurrection, the committee says Hannity seemed to sound the alarm, texting, I'm very worried about the next 48 hours. And the next day, those fears were realized. During the riot, Hannity texted Meadows, quote, can he make a statement, ask people to leave the Capitol? That night on Fox News, Hannity condemned the rioters. And all of today's perpetrators must be arrested and prosecuted to the full extent of the law. And days after the riot, Hannity wrote Meadows and Congressman Jim Jordan, describing a difficult conversation he had just had with Trump, writing, quote, he can't mention the election again, ever. I did not have a good call with him today. And worse, I'm not sure what is left to do or say, and I don't like not knowing if it's truly understood. Hannity really making his concerns known there. Jonathan Carl joins us now. Hey John, how is Hannity responding to all this tonight? Hannity's lawyer has just put out a statement saying they are evaluating the committee's request and saying, quote, we remain very concerned about the constitutional implications, especially as it relates to the First Amendment. They say they will respond to the committee's request as appropriate. Uh, so no direct answer yet as to whether or not they will cooperate, but certainly doesn't sound like they're leaning in that direction, Lindsay. Meanwhile, former President Trump had planned to speak on January 6th. He just released a statement a little while ago saying that's no longer the case. Why? Yeah, uh, he had been billing this as a press conference, Lindsay, a press conference on January 6th. And uh, he, you know, said that he was canceling it with a whole long list of complaints about about the news media. But apparently he does not want at this point uh, to be taking questions from members of the press. All right, Jonathan Carl, our thanks to you. Thank you, Lindsay. And when we come back, the four-year-old wounded during a shootout and the little girl's connection to George Floyd. Prince Andrew's attorneys in a New York courtroom. More on how they are trying to get a court to dismiss a lawsuit brought on by a woman who claims the royal sexually assaulted her when she was 17. 
But up next, the searing look into family divisions caused by January 6th, the children pitted against their parents. We meet one family whose first reunion in about a year will soon happen in a federal court. Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family, himself, in jeopardy for us. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. This is what being live is Three all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. Run, urgent delivery run. Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Houston police are investigating a shooting that left a four-year-old girl wounded. The young girl who was shot while asleep is the niece of George Floyd, whose death caused millions to protest in the streets in 2020. The incident took place on the city's south side. The girl underwent surgery and is expected to recover. The events of January 6, 2021 shook many families to their core. Tonight, as we get ready to mark one year since that dark day, a Texas family remains broken, slowly trying to rebuild their fractured relationships with each other after a son turned in his father. ABC's Maria Villarreal has their story. Coming for you! I didn't know exactly what was going to happen on January 6th. To be honest, I thought it was all bluff. I was scared when he went to January 6th. I was really scared once, you know, it was on the news and stuff. I was really freaking out. January 6th, 2021 was the day that changed America. Mayhem on the steps of the nation's beacon of democracy. Defiance and violence running rampant inside the halls of the Capitol. <laughs> exposing the fast-growing cancer of distrust and hate. <laughs> no! 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 
in a suburb just outside Dallas, Texas, peace has been in short supply for Guy Reffitt's family, broken and shaken to its core after he attended former President Trump's rally in protest at the Capitol. The 49-year-old is now in jail, awaiting trial among the more than 700 indicted. Did January 6th tear your family apart? It has temporarily fractured us. That fracture largely caused by the revelation Reffitt's 19-year-old son Jackson went to the FBI with concerns about his father in the days leading up to the insurrection. He was getting involved in a lot of different people and a lot of bad people and a lot of bad communities. Jackson's mom acknowledges her husband is a member of the three percenters. According to the Anti-Defamation League, they are anti-government extremists who are part of the militia movement. When did you feel then, like, I have to reach out to the FBI? Was there a point that you felt that way? It was kind of just like, OK, I'm just doing this. Like, I just have to do this. Like, I, if something is to really happen, then I do not want this on my shoulders as the only one that actually sees what he's doing right now. Weeks later, Jackson says his worst fears were confirmed. I went home to check up on everyone and everyone's sitting around the TV, and my mom looks at me and is like, your dad's there. And hearing my father that was there, it was absolutely disgusting. And it really lost all um, respect for him in that moment. According to court documents, when Reffitt returned from Washington, he started making threatening statements to his children. My father brought up that, like, if anyone turns me in, like, um, you know, happens to traitors, traitors get shot. And that spooked me and my sister. Were you ever afraid that your dad was going to harm you or Jackson? No, I was never afraid of that. It's bizarre to me to hear that because, I mean, he has said so many ridiculous things. I mean, I have 21 years of telling Guy, you can't say stuff like that. I definitely sent the tip in. Jackson became an FBI informant, handing over recordings he taped of his father after the riots. Days later, the FBI arrested Reffitt at his home with his family watching. When I woke up, my first thought was nukes were falling from the sky because that's what the flash bangs sounded like. They pointed guns at us, and there was a battering ram. I saw his silhouette in the back of a state marshal car um, when I pulled up to the house, and that was the last time I saw him. After everything came public, um, I, I mean, I just packed up my basic things, and I was like, I just, I can't be here. Nearly a year after the raid, Jackson is still living on his own with his girlfriend. It has been so difficult, uh, the void that's been left by Jackson and Guy. Professor Cynthia Miller Idris is an expert on extremism and radicalization. She's seen an increase in polarization among families in recent years. Whenever you have rising political violence or extremism or hateful acts or other kinds of violent crimes, families are shattered. The family that's left behind needs a lot of support and therapeutic intervention. The family says this past year has been an emotional roller coaster. I know that in front of your girls, you definitely kept it together, but there's got to be those moments. Oh, yeah. Um, actually, I work six minutes um, away from my house, and I cry for six minutes to work, and I pull myself together. When I get back in my car, I cry all the way home. And then I get out and I make dinner. So you give yourself 12 minutes in a day? Yeah. That is really all that is available. We would have hours of just wailing and screaming in the house of all of us just crying because we just can't believe that this is happening. With Reffitt gone, money is tight and paying bills isn't easy. Sarah and I work as much as we can to make sure that Peyton can stay where she is, at least during her senior year. You know, Peyton should be looking for a prom dress. That's what we should be doing. Jackson says he feels responsible for the rift between him, his mom, and his sisters. I also bear that guilt to pretty much tear this family apart. And it sucks. But I can't do much about it. You feel responsible for... Absolutely. And I know a lot of people tell me that it's not your fault and that my father is an adult, but... I mean, it doesn't take away from my guilt at all. Do you guys blame him? I blame both of them for, um, both of them. I don't believe my dad should have gone to the Capitol, but he did. And I don't believe Jackson should have turned my dad in, but he did. Reffitt was charged with five counts, including allegedly carrying a semi-automatic weapon on Capitol grounds. <laughs> He's one of at least 10 rioters arrested with ties to the three percenters, he spoke to ABC News from jail during a phone conversation with his daughters. From my point of view, this has been disastrous for me and my family. 
especially for my girls, my son, actually all of my family. It's not an easy thing to happen. I never expected anything like this to happen for a protest, and that's all I went to do. Reffitt has pleaded not guilty and could face decades in prison if convicted. I feel like I'll be exonerated. It's not hard to prove that I didn't do anything. It should be pretty easy. He hopes to have a relationship with his son Jackson someday. That's my son. I love my son. I will always love my son. For now, the family is trying to take those difficult steps to reconnect. I have anger, but I love him. I'm angry because he took away my last, you know, years growing up with my dad. And, you know, that's really hard. Are you ready to move on? Yeah, I'm ready to move on. I'm, I'm ready to heal. Over the last few weeks, Jackson and his family have started to text and talk more. The first time the whole family will be together in one place in more than a year won't be a reunion at home. It'll be here in federal court when Guy's trial begins in February. Being there and that whole situation is just going to be so nerve-wracking. I hope it'll go smoothly and well for both sides and everyone involved. And in the end, everything, once it's all set in stone, we can go back and really start, um, I guess, hanging out and getting back together and catching up. What happens if he is found guilty and he has to stay in there longer? Then we'll know that. We'll be prepared mm -hmm. for that. I mean, that, that's an answer. Right mm -hmm. now, we have no answers. A divided family trying to push past the fear, hoping their love for each other gets them through the pain, still fresh from one of America's darkest days. I have an end game in sight, and that is just for us to be the party of five again. And I will not stop until that happens. I don't care what path we're going to have to take, how much healing and therapy we're going to have to have. I am not going to allow ideology to fracture my family this way. Quite a story there are. Thanks to Maria for that. ABC News Live will have complete coverage all week as we mark one year since the attack on our nation's capital. On Thursday, we will be on air all day with continuing coverage. And after ABC News Prime Thursday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, be sure to tune in to Homegrown Standoff to Rebellion, examining the events leading up to that infamous day, featuring an interview with former Oath Keeper Eamon Bundy, premiering tomorrow on Hulu. Still ahead here on Prime, the prosecutor's decision on whether former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo will face groping charges. The reigning Jeopardy! champion reveals she was robbed. We have the details. And the new lockdown in China, millions ordered sometimes forced to stay home in one city. This with the Winter Olympics looming. We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, Virginia Senator Tim Kaine on a commute he will never forget. An extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pow. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. Breaking news overnight. Your money and concerns about inflation. The pandemic is not over. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was going to say. And what to expect in the day ahead. From the top of the world, baby. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Weekday morning starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. 
Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings, more and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Welcome to This Week. being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back, everyone. Now to China, where strict COVID lockdowns are keeping millions of people at home. Some are posting on social media saying it's a struggle to get their food and other necessities, a claim Chinese authorities have disputed. We take a look by the numbers. Some 13 million residents of Xi'an, China, an industrial hub in the northwest, have been under strict lockdown for nearly two weeks with travel to and from the city suspended. Xi'an has seen more than 1,600 COVID cases in the latest Delta surge, but so far, Omicron does not appear to be widespread in China. The restrictions in Xi'an and other provinces are some of the harshest since China imposed a strict lockdown of more than 11 million people in and around Wuhan when the coronavirus was first detected in late 2019. Roughly 4,600, that's China's death toll from COVID since the pandemic began, according to Chinese officials. That's a tiny fraction of what we've seen here in the U.S. despite China's much larger population. In fact, zero. That's how many deaths from COVID China has reported in the past 11 months, including in Xi'an. The recent lockdowns come just one month before the start of the Beijing Winter Olympics. For these games, athletes, officials, and journalists will all enter a bubble, and no fans outside of China will be allowed to attend. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The Democratic push to change voting rights laws and how Senator Joe Manchin feels about it. Melania Trump once again doubling down in the crypto world. And the words that should never, ever be repeated again, according to one group. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. Time, anytime, Nightline. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. 
Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find. Unless you try to find it. This is what being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Come on. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. More than 27 hours into this nightmare on I-95, there are still cars abandoned on the highway after hundreds of drivers, families, stranded all night. Vehicles starting to run out of gas. Food, water is an issue for some of these people. It started with multiple tractor trailers jackknifing near Fredericksburg, Virginia, as temperatures plummeted below freezing. Oh, guys. How long have you been out here? Since 8, 8 30 last night. Senator Tim Kaine, among the hundreds trapped overnight in the traffic jam, tweeting, quote, I started my normal two hour drive to DC at 1 p.m. yesterday. 19 hours later, I'm still not near the Capitol. And hundreds of Amtrak passengers were stranded on board a train in Lynchburg, Virginia, after a winter storm pulled down trees and power lines onto the tracks. At airports across the country, thanks to the weather and COVID related staffing issues, nearly 1,500 flights were canceled. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is pushing forward to introduce a measure to change the Senate's rules to help pass voting rights reform. In his first speech on the Senate floor this year, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer endorsed the idea of changing the chamber's 60 vote requirement to pass voting rights legislation. If Republicans continue to hijack the rules of the chamber to prevent action on something as critical as protecting our democracy, then the Senate will debate and consider changes to the rules. All 50 Democrats would need to be in favor of carving out a change in the rules to pass voting rights reform. Senator Joe Manchin still sounds skeptical. Anytime there's a, a, a carve out, uh, you eat the whole turkey. Let me just say, let me just say that, that, that to being open to uh, a rules change that would uh, create a nuclear option, uh, it's, it's, it's a very, very difficult, so it's a heavy lift. Well, the forcible touching case against former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo has now been dropped by the Albany County District Attorney. DA David Soros says his office's investigation found Brittany Camiso's allegations credible and deeply troubling, but he says there wasn't enough evidence to successfully prosecute Cuomo. Camiso accused Cuomo of groping her in the governor's mansion back in 2020. In the New York Attorney General's report that led to Cuomo's resignation, Camiso's attorney says that she will continue to speak the truth and seek justice in an appropriate civil action. Reigning Jeopardy champ Amy Schneider revealed she was robbed over New Year's weekend. She tweeted that she's fine but lost her ID, credit cards and phone. Schneider broke the all-time record for most consecutive Jeopardy wins by a woman. She's also the first transgender contestant to qualify for the Tournament of Champions. Melania Trump is doubling down on cryptocurrency with the online sale of a white hat she wore during a 2018 visit with French President Emmanuel Macron. The auction also including a painting and a piece of digital artwork. The opening bid for the hat is set at $250,000, but you can't pay for it with Amex. She'll only accept Solana cryptocurrency. Back in December, Mrs. Trump announced her new venture selling NFTs, a form of digital collectibles. In addition to the hat, the NFT being sold in this month's auction is a digital painting commemorating the visit by Macron. She says a portion of the proceeds will benefit the foster care community. 
Well, the American Kennel Club just announced two new breeds of dogs. Meet the Moody and the Russian Toy. The Moody comes from a long line of Hungarian sheep dogs. It was first named around 1930. The Russian Toy got its name because they were a fan favorite of Russian elite back in the 1700s. The dogs max out at six and a half pounds. By the way, the two dogs can now compete for best in show at U.S. dog shows, including the Westminster Kennel Club show. Welcome back, everyone. Now to Britain's Prince Andrew. His lawyers appeared in a federal court here in New York to argue for the dismissal of a lawsuit claiming that he sexually assaulted an American woman when she was just 17. They claim a settlement between the woman, Virginia Giuffre, and Jeffrey Epstein prevents her from suing the prince because it applied to, quote, potential defendants, including people accused in her 2009 lawsuit of wrongdoing, including royals. Here's ABC's James Longman. This is the only way Prince Andrew has ever seen in public these days, at the wheel of his car on his mother's Windsor estate, forced out of public life because of sexual assault allegations, essentially a prince in hiding. He denies Virginia Jeffrey's claims that he had sex with her after she was trafficked as a minor by Jeffrey Epstein. Their teams are now locked in a legal battle, waiting for a New York judge to decide whether the accuser's case moves forward. Both sides presented their arguments Tuesday, the prince's attorney saying the suit should be dismissed, and they're pointing to language in a newly unsealed settlement of a 2009 lawsuit between accuser Virginia Roberts Jeffrey and convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein, which prevented Jeffrey from suing other, quote, potential defendants. Prince Andrew was not named in that 2009 lawsuit, but his lawyers are saying he should fall under the definition of potential defendant. Jeffrey's team are arguing that language does not apply to the royal and he should not be exempted from litigation. If you're Prince Andrew's lawyer, you're not thrilled about the questions and comments that the judge was making today. He seemed skeptical that Prince Andrew could come in and try and enforce that settlement agreement by himself. The unsealed 2009 document also shows details of the settlement Jeffrey reached with sex predator Jeffrey Epstein. She received $500,000, agreeing not to sue Epstein or other, quote, potential defendants. Attorneys for the Duke of York argue these documents should prevent him from being sued and exclude him from further litigation. It's not the only argument the Duke's legal team is using to try and get the case dismissed. They say Jeffrey lives in Australia and not the US where the suit was filed. And today the judge turned down the defence's request to pause the proceedings. I've said consistently and, um, and frequently that we never had any sort of sexual contact. Prince Andrew has denied Jeffrey's claims, but pressure has been mounting since his longtime friend Ghislaine Maxwell's conviction for sex trafficking just before the new year. I'd known her since uh, she was at university in the UK. Um, and it would be, to some extent, a stretch to say that, that um, uh, as it were, we were close friends. In this now infamous BBC interview, he admitted to having stayed in Epstein's New York City property even after Epstein was convicted of sex trafficking. And it was this response to allegations made by Jeffrey about his sweating that triggered a public response from which he is yet to recover. I, I, I have a peculiar medical condition, which is that I don't sweat, um, or I didn't sweat at the time, and that was, oh, was she? Yes, I didn't sweat at the time, because I um, ha had suffered what I would describe as an overdose of adrenaline in the Falklands War when I was shot at. Andrew's attorneys have called Jeffrey's lawsuit baseless, meant to achieve another payday. The case is still pending. The judge indicated a decision on whether to grant the prince's motion to dismiss we made soon. But whatever the outcome, many royal experts say the damage to the monarchy has already been done. James Longman, ABC News in London. Our thanks to James for that. And for more on this case, we bring in ABC News contributor and Royals expert Victoria Murphy. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, Victoria. How important was today's court hearing? Hi there, good evening, Lindsay. Well, this was a pivotal moment in the case against Prince Andrew. His lawyers have been focusing their attentions on trying to get this case thrown out. And this was their chance, their opportunity to make their points in court over why 
they thought this should be the case. I have to say, listening to the hearing today, it did sound very much that Judge um, Lewis Kaplan was being very heavily scrutinising some of the points that Prince Andrew's lawyers were making. One of the points he completely shut down straight away. Um, Prince Andrew's lawyers were saying that Virginia Giuffre should be more specific, more detailed about her allegations at this stage before disclosure. And the judge simply said, you know, that's not going to happen. She's not required to do that by law. He also raised his own questions about whether or not this settlement agreement, which Virginia signed with Jeffrey Epstein, can actually be used by Prince Andrew's lawyers to stop this case against him from proceeding. Having said that, he hasn't made a decision. And he said at the end of the hearing that he would do so pretty soon. So we're now very much at a crossroads, and this will either proceed to a trial or it will be halted in his track. So a very pivotal moment for the prince. And as you said, we're still waiting for the judge to rule on whether this case moves forward. But even now, at this point, what has this all done to Prince Andrew's image? Well, this has already, Lindsay, you know, significantly damaged Prince Andrew's reputation. These allegations are very serious. And what you've had going on in the background of these legal proceedings is, of course, the court of public opinion. And that is not to be underestimated because it was public opinion in itself that led to him actually stepping back in 2019 when he gave that disastrous TV interview with the BBC about his friendship with Jeffrey Epstein. And that was way before this legal action, this particular legal action against him had even been brought by Jeffrey. But to a certain extent, you know, what happens now will really determine where public opinion lands on this. If this proceeds to trial, then, of course, you have the ultimately all of the damaging information that could come out as a result of a trial. And the most damaging outcome would be, of course, that he is found at fault. But if this case is thrown out on a legal argument, it doesn't completely turn things around for him. It avoids that trial, it avoids that worst case scenario outcome. But I think for a lot of people in the court of public opinion, for him to be fully rehabilitated, what he needs to do really is tackle these allegations head on, protect his innocence as he has done outside of the courtroom. And unless that happens, it's very difficult to see how he can completely rehabilitate his public image and resume royal life as he was doing before. And how has the royal family coped with all of this? What's the impact on the family standing in the UK at this point? Well, it's been significant. You know, the royal family is very aware of how damaging that these allegations have been for Prince Andrew particularly, but also for the institution of the monarchy generally. But their strategy has been to totally cut him loose. Um, the Queen's lawyers are nowhere near this case. He has his own legal team. He has his own PR team. And he is no longer a public face of the monarchy. He has not appeared publicly for more than two years now with the royal family, apart from at his own father's funeral. And that really tells us everything we need to know about how they understand just how toxic his image is to the institution. I think what's interesting is that we're seeing that Andrews is polling very badly with the public. Um, it's a bit more difficult to get polling on the institution generally, but actually the individual reputations of other royals do not at this stage seem to have been affected, opinion polls show. We're seeing them polling you know, William, Kate, the Queen, still very popular as they have been in previous years. So don't seem yet to have been directly affected by this. So outside of not having him make public appearances with the family, is there anything else that Buckingham Palace can do at this point to try to limit the damage? Could they strip Prince Andrew of titles or military honors, for example? Well, they can do those things. He still does have his royal title, the Duke of York, um, he could be stopped from using that. In order to take it away completely, that would have to be done by Parliament. And he still lives within the grounds of a royal residence. He lives in the grounds of Windsor Castle. That could be prevented from happening. But you might say that those things actually are, are relatively sort of detailed, small details in comparison to having him step back from the public face of the monarchy completely, which he has already done. And I think, you know, that raises a, a fundamental point here, which is that what you can't do is remove him from the family. He is the Queen's son, and that will continue to be the case. And this will continue, therefore, to impact on the royal family. She presided over him stepping back. She's made it clear that she does not back him as his boss. But as his mother, of course, she still supports him personally. We've seen her out riding with him. And that highlights really the conflict in this situation and why it will continue to cause damage for the monarchy. Right, the mother versus the queen, two very different roles to, to try to balance there. Victoria Murphy, we thank you so much for your time and insight. Thank you so much.
Authorities are investigating a deadly fall at Hawaii's Kilauea volcano. Officials say a 75-year-old fell about 100 feet from a viewing area in the national park. His body was later recovered from a closed area. Police say people have been visiting recently at night to see glowing lava from the volcano. Word up. When was the last time you heard that? Lake Superior State University is out with this year's list of banished words for misuse, overuse, and uselessness. That being said, our own Will Gans is here to take a deep dive into our new normal vernacular. Since New Year's Day 1976, the annual Banished Words List has been compiled by Lake Superior State University, combing through thousands of submissions, selecting the top 10 words and terms that we're not bringing with us into the new year. Past winners, or losers perhaps, include Chill Out and It's the Pits back in 1980. And in 1987... Cheers is filmed before a live studio audience. The reason? Would they film before dead studio audiences? And in 1997... Ugh, oh, as if! As if, and duh, nominated by many, selected for their overuse. Surprisingly, only three of the ten banished words are COVID-19 related. Supply chain, you're on mute, and new normal. One of the submissions pointing out, after a couple of years, is any of this really new? As for the everyday terms that are getting the axe this year, how about the one phrase that pops up in emails that drives office workers totally nuts? Circle back, as in, we'll circle back to this explanation a little later. LSSU saying, why are we circling back? It's a conversation, not the Winter Olympics. And rounding out this year's banished words, number three at the end of the day. Coming in at number two, no worries. Judges saying this phrase incorrectly substitutes for you're welcome when someone says thank you. And finally, coming in at number one, the worst and most misused and overused phrase of the year. Wait, what? That's the most banished phrase? Wait, what? There you go. Our thanks to Will for bringing us that story. I was hoping they would have gotten rid of it is what it is. Before we go tonight, our image of the day. Take a look at this incredible image of a meteor shower pictured near the northwest China-Mongolian border. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. For the next hour, the heartbreaking accident, how one trooper killed his brother, a fellow officer. And our conversation with California lawmaker Karen Bass with the grim January 6th anniversary looming when we come back. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by no people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3. What you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The ladies you love. The hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen.
Awards. Honored, winner of nine Edward R. Murrow Awards, more than any other network, including winning for the third straight year the Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News is America's number one news source. With so much at stake, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one newscast and the number one program on television. Hey everyone, I'm Linda Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. A North Carolina State Highway Patrol has died in deadly crash involving his brother. Authorities say Trooper James Horton was responding to a traffic stop in Rutherford County to help his brother, who's also an officer, but on the way to help, he lost control of the vehicle, slamming into his brother's police car, killing him and the driver who had been pulled over. Trooper James was treated for minor injuries. Police in San Antonio are asking for the public's help as the search for a three-year-old enters now its third week. Police say Lena Sadarkil was last seen on December 20th at a park. Lena's family is part of the Afghan refugee community and alerts in multiple languages have been issued. And a record 4.5 million Americans quit their jobs in November. That's the highest number going all the way back to 2000. Economists say this is another sign of a hot job market where workers are in such high demand they're able to make decisions about the kinds of jobs that they want to do. These figures came out before the Omicron surge. But we begin with the travel nightmare that is not over yet. People trapped in their cars for nearly 24 hours, talking about an entire day. And those flight cancellations also continue. Kenneth Moten has more. Tonight, more than 27 hours into this nightmare on I-95, there are still cars abandoned on the highway after hundreds of drivers, families stranded all night. Vehicles starting to run out of gas. Food, water is an issue for some of these people. It started with multiple tractor trailers jackknifing near Fredericksburg, Virginia, as temperatures plummeted below freezing. Travelers like Kimberly Gibson and her family desperate for information. Our cell phones don't work. Um, internet goes in and out, so it's we've just been sitting here. The Virginia Department of Transportation calling the situation unprecedented. Been in this spot for seven hours, almost eight hours. Even Virginia Senator Tim Kaine was stuck. His staff tweeting he was back at the Capitol after 27 hours. This is my daughter next to me having what's left of our snack stash. Jennifer Travis and her family able to get off the interstate only to get stuck along an alternate route. We can't get out. All of the side streets are congested. Um, everything is red. Uh, we're tired. We're exhausted. We have been on the road since 2 o'clock in the afternoon yesterday. Forecasters predicted up to a foot of snow in the region, and the first major winter storm of the season delivered. We were not able to pre-treat our roadways before, before and this is due to the rain. The rain would have washed all of our chemicals and salt off the road. And it wasn't just cars. An Amtrak train from New Orleans to New York stranded in Lynchburg, resuming its journey late today. Our thanks to Kenneth for that. And now to the coronavirus pandemic. President Biden addressed the nation this afternoon as cases rapidly rise across the country. This is millions of children head back to school this week amid the growing surge. ABC's Rena Roy has the latest. President Biden ramping up the fight against COVID as the Omicron variant drives this winter surge. These coming weeks are going to be challenging. We have the tools to protect people from severe illness due to Omicron. Biden doubling the government's purchase of Pfizer's COVID antiviral pill from 10 to 20 million treatment courses. These pills are going to dramatically decrease hospitalizations and deaths from COVID-19. They're a game changer. The CDC estimates the Omicron variant is responsible for 95% of new cases across the country as of January 1st, compared to less than 1% just a month ago. Over 100,000 infected Americans are now hospitalized, more than doubled the total from early November. And as millions head back to school this week, there's growing concern for America's children. With 325,000 kids testing positive for the virus last week alone, according 
according to the American Academy of Pediatrics. We need to help work with each other to help keep each other safe. So I'm begging people to get vaccinated. More of America's youth could get boosted as early as this week, with the CDC expected to sign off on booster shots for 12 to 15 year olds. Booster shots work. They significantly increase the protection that provide the highest level of protection against Omicron. Federal health officials also recommending everybody 12 and up originally vaccinated with Pfizer get their booster after five months instead of six. Be prepared, protect yourself, get vaccinated, get your boosters. Um, I was reluctant at first, but I am glad that I did. Fox News host Sean Hannity is the latest person to be asked to cooperate with the January 6th committee. And it all stems from a text exchange with then-President Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, and others in the days leading up to the attack. Here's ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. Tonight, the House January 6th committee is asking to speak to Fox News host Sean Hannity, describing him as a de facto advisor to former President Donald Trump. The committee already has dozens of text messages Hannity exchanged with former Chief of Staff Mark Meadows and others. On December 31st, a week before the insurrection, Hannity seemed to warn Meadows that top lawyers at the White House were on the verge of resigning en masse to protest Trump's plans to overturn the election. He texted, quote, We can't lose the entire White House counsel's office. I do not see January 6th happening the way he is being told. On January 5th, the day before the insurrection, the committee says Hannity seemed to sound the alarm, texting, I'm very worried about the next 48 hours. Let's go! And the next day, those fears were realized. During the riot, Hannity texted Meadows, quote, can he make a statement, ask people to leave the Capitol? That night on Fox News, Hannity condemned the rioters. And all of today's perpetrators must be arrested and prosecuted to the full extent of the law. And days after the riot, Hannity wrote Meadows and Congressman Jim Jordan, describing a difficult conversation he had just had with Trump, writing, quote, He can't mention the election again, ever. I did not have a good call with him today, and worse, I'm not sure what is left to do or say, and I don't like not knowing if it's truly understood. Our thanks to Jonathan Carl. And now for more on the one-year mark since the January 6th attack on the Capitol, we are joined by Democratic Congresswoman Karen Bass of California. Congresswoman, thanks as always for coming on the show. Sure. Of course, it's been one year nearly since the day when you and your colleagues faced that insurrection. And now that you've had the time to reflect on the gravity of that day, are you surprised the violence re reached such a crescendo or, or should we have all seen it coming? Well, it's a little bit of both, you know. Uh, absolutely, I was surprised. I mean, I had told my friends and family the day before not to worry about me. I was going to be in one of the safest places in the country. I was going to be inside the Capitol. And so, uh, although we all anticipated something, never, never in a million years would I would have imagined what took place uh, actually happened. Democrats have several events planned, as you know, to mark the day on Thursday. But most Republicans have remained rather uh, quiet uh, with regard to the one-year mark. H have you found it difficult to work with members on the other side of the aisle in, in the past year, especially those who have downplayed the actions of that day and, and what led up to them? Well, I think being a member of Congress in this environment, we all learn to compartmentalize. But I will tell you that there are a handful of members who absolutely have distorted, lied, exaggerated about what took place on that day, complete denial that it even happened, even saying that it really wasn't Trump supporters, it was Antifa, it was Black Lives Matter, uh, anything to get away from the truth. And it is hard to sit in a hearing and listen to that over and over again when you know that it is 100 percent false. And the country, as you know, again, remains deeply divided with a considerable portion of the population still believing that the 2020 election was stolen. Right. Is there anything that, that you can see that can change just how polarized we are? Well, I mean, first of all, we really have to get back to understanding that there is a difference between the truth and a lie. And it just is not acceptable for people to put out 
absolute false information. And frankly, that division, the division, the anger, all of that is one of the reasons why I decided to come home because I certainly didn't want to see the same type of division take place in my city. But I will tell you that in DC now, it's not just a matter of the members that we all wonder, were they actually involved in the planning? Uh, but it's the staff, and then it's some members of the Capitol Police, and that's a terrible thing. You know that one member of the police uh, force was indicted, and then, you know, very little is said about the officers that died either that day or several days later. So the tragedy is still very much alive in all of us on the Hill, and to this day, now, when I go to vote in the House chambers, I have to go through metal detectors because of my colleagues that want to carry guns on the House floor and understand that the only people in the chamber are other members of Congress. So no, it has not left us. That's very much real. And hopefully we'll be able to get to the bottom of just who was involved, to what extent, at what level. Democrats are once again pushing for voting rights reform at the federal level. But as you know, at the local and state level, more people who support the former president's false claims about the election have gained power in many states. How concerned are you about the potential outcome of future elections after what we experienced last year? Oh, I'm deeply concerned. And it's not just people's opinions, but it's the fact that in some states, that they are moving to change the way the election process takes place. And if they don't like the results, when they just, they just change the people that tabulate the results. So what we're seeing happen in this country, when it happens in other countries, the United States issues, denounces what happened, talks about cutting foreign aid, and sanctions countries. We even refer to it as a closing of democratic space. That is exactly what is happening in the United States of America. And it's bad enough, the impact that it has on our country, but it is extremely damaging to our standing around the world. You know, leading up to the election, we had various voting officials on the show, and I would ask them, uh, what keeps you up at night, you know, leading up to that day? And I'd like to pose the same question to you. What keeps you up at night with regard to the state of our democracy? Oh, what keeps me up at night is, is absolutely the threat to voting and the fact that we have got to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. In addition to that, the other thing that keeps me up at night is knowing that there are cells around our country that essentially, in my opinion, are involved in or can be involved in domestic terrorism. I mean, what happened on that day, we know probably the majority of people were caught up in the crowd, but there were some very deliberate organized forces that were there, some connected to the military, some connected to law enforcement. And the fact that we have not uncovered the truth just yet is very scary and keeps me up at night. And then there are all of those people that have the same tendencies that weren't there on January 6th. So I think we need to take a very hard look in the mirror in our country at the state of our democracy and at the state of the division that has taken place. And unfortunately, uh, President Trump led that division. And that division, I believe, has spilled over to cities and states around the country. I'm worried about the division in my own city around the problem that we have over 40,000 people who are unhoused and how now there's a level of anger that has set in about this. It's a humanitarian crisis. It shouldn't be dealt with in that way. So I think that this has impacted our country in some very profound ways. Uh, Congressman, I just want to go back to one of the points that you made with regard to, you, you said that we haven't discovered the truth yet about, you know, who was right. involved, to what ex extent uh, people were involved in January 6th. Why haven't, I mean, it's been a year. I mean, how long does it take? And, and we're dealing with what we think are, are some of the most highly esteemed people in our country who are working on getting to the bottom of this. A year later, we still don't really know the tentacles. Well, the, the uh, January 6th um, task force that was set up, select committee that was set up by the speaker, is absolutely on its way to getting the information. And I'm sure the committee members know far more than I do, but we're going to learn more uh, in the near future. But the reason, one of the reasons why it's taken so long is the same thing we suffered from 
four years during the Trump administration is they're not cooperating. <laughs> they're not they're not cooperating. They believe that they were above the law, and many of the people that are being subpoenaed or asked to come before the committee are continuing to have that same type of behavior, even trying to hide under Trump's uh, fictitious um, executive privilege, which he no longer has because he is just now a normal citizen. So, um, so I think that, that we have a lot further to go. Now, I do believe that one of the delay tactics is Republicans want to hold out until the next election where they believe that they're going to take back the House. And then, of course, they will disband the committee immediately. The country needs to know the truth. Need to get those answers. Congresswoman Karen Bass of California, we thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you. And still to come, the terrifying close call for Haiti's prime minister when gunshots ring out. And what our team who was inside the Capitol remember about January 6th. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family, himself, in jeopardy for us. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. Right, this is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Welcome back, everyone. We are tracking several headlines from around the world. Haiti has already had a violent first week of the year. We're getting our first look at these images from over the weekend as a shootout took place between the Prime Minister of Security and an armed group that had warned the leader not step foot in their city. According to local media, one person did die and another two were injured, but the Prime Minister was not hurt. This incident is just the latest blow to a fragile interim regime that continues to struggle with poverty and a surge in gang violence. Despite free Freezing temperatures and snowy trenches, Ukrainian soldiers remain determined to stand their ground and are ready for any escalation from Russia. The soldiers adding a homey feel to their barracks by decorating it with Christmas trees and drawings made by children showing a war tank and Ukrainian flag. One soldier telling the Associated Press, quote, 
we will not give up our country. And in Chile, one expression of freedom of speech is getting a lot of buzz. Four beekeepers were detained after placing around 60 beehives with an estimated 10,000 bees in front of the presidential palace as a form of protest. This comes after beekeepers have requested to meet with the president to discuss reforms to improve honey prices or provide subsidies. Honey production has been deeply impacted by a long-term drought. Despite seven police officers being stung, there were no reports of serious injuries. Now to federal court here in New York, lawyers for Britain's Prince Andrew argued for dismissal of a lawsuit claiming that he sexually assaulted an American woman when she was just 17. They claim a settlement between the woman Virginia Giuffre and Jeffrey Epstein prevents her from suing the prince because it applied to, quote, potential defendants, including people accused in her 2009 lawsuit of wrongdoing, including royals. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. Tonight, a federal judge now weighing whether that sexual assault civil suit against Prince Andrew filed by Virginia Roberts Jufre should be thrown out. Lawyers for both sides today arguing over language contained in a newly unsealed settlement from a 2009 sex trafficking lawsuit between Jufre and convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. That half million dollar secret deal agreeing to release, acquit and forever discharge not only Epstein, but any other person or entity who could have been included as a potential defendant. While Prince Andrew was not named in that 2009 lawsuit, it alleged that Jufre was sexually exploited by parties with ties to Epstein, including royalty. The prince has repeatedly denied any sexual encounters with Jufre, but today his lawyers claiming the settlement shields him, saying Prince Andrew could have been sued in that 2009 Florida action. He was not and therefore was a potential defendant. Jufre's team countering that the 2009 lawsuit against Epstein did not apply to the prince. This is a critical hearing because this is the point where the judge is either going to allow the fact-finding to begin. Prince Andrew's gonna have to answer questions or he's gonna end the case. And Lindsay, the judge calling both arguments reasonable but saying that the terms of that 2009 settlement should have been determined between Jufre and Epstein. Epstein, of course, died by suicide in 2019. The judge saying he expects to make a decision soon. Lindsay? Really a complicated matter there, our thanks to Ariel. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. But before we go, as we get ready to mark one year since January 6th, we asked our coworkers who were at the Capitol that day what they remembered about that singular day in American history. Take a listen to what they had to say. And thank you so much for streaming with us. Thank you, Mom. It felt like a war zone where the population is uprising and, and going after you. I never would have dreamed in a million years they would have made it into the building. Nothing could have been further from my mind. USA! USA! That is the nation's capital. And the scene of literally hundreds of people forcing their way into the building. The word that stands out the most to me is chaos. The trauma and the weight of January 6th has not left. Very early in the morning, people were walking in streams of people, carrying Trump signs, carrying American flags. But there was something about that morning that felt a little different. We will never give up. We will never concede. Our country has had enough. We will not take it anymore. And that's what this is all about. I got word that Donald Trump had asked his people to go to the Capitol and that he would be joining them. It was my first day covering Capitol Hill. I think for a lot of people who were there that day, it is something that is really not easy to talk about. We were being surrounded by a group of uh, Trump supporters who were not happy that we were there. They kept asking me, when am I going to believe the truth? When am I going to see the truth? You could hear them um, if you got close enough to the windows. You could hear the people, the, the noise was growing outside. We started getting these reports from our Capitol Hill troops that they people were literally trying to force their way inside the Capitol. 
We can say with a certain amount of specificity and certitude that the U.S. Capitol Police were not fully prepared in the way that they should have been prepared. An announcement is made inside the Capitol. It's a loud noise. The law enforcement officer who's making that announcement tells us the building is in lockdown. It's dawning on us, you know, like something's gone wrong, you know, and all of a sudden one of the cops we've known forever comes running up and he yells at us, get back upstairs, get back upstairs, they're in the building. We've spent four years of hearing Donald Trump declare us the enemy of the people, so we know that we're gonna be one of the targets. We start covering everything that says press gallery. We're trying to lock the doors. Oh, we're in the basement. In moments of strife, you're, you still have to do your job, so you just have to push it away and try to keep doing your job. One of the first people who came out and was leaving the Capitol said to me, you don't want to go in there. They just shot a girl in the neck. We didn't know what was going on inside. We had no idea how bad it was at that point. According to Justice Department summaries, well over $1.5 million worth of damage was done to the US Capitol, let alone the images of a man walking around carrying a Confederate flag let alone people walking around carrying lecterns from the legislative chambers, let alone people going to the Speaker of the House's office and putting up their feet. But I remember standing there looking up at our gorgeous Capitol and had a sense of unreality, knowing that this was one of the worst days in American history. To look to my right and see people being arrested who'd stormed it, see the National Guard, it, it was an unbelievable moment. I don't think the Capitol will ever be the same. Every single day you have staff, you have press, you have lawmakers, you have police officers who are returning back to a building where they experience so much pain. Anybody that was there that day, you have this bond with them, even if you don't know them. You instantly share with police officers, custodians, with anybody. If you were there that day, you can talk about it in a way that, yeah, I know, I know, it's hard. I think the single most important thing that's being forgotten about that day is the police officers and the trauma and the hell that they went through. I've had, you know, police officers, I, thought the world of, um, you know, commit suicide. January 6th just exaggerated the divide in our country. The country was all already divided. You, you can respect someone's opinion on the other side, but you can't respect anybody who carried out something like that on Capitol Hill. That's not a political divide. That is a reality divide. That, that is a stark, stark red line. I think a lot of people on Capitol Hill have been surprised by some efforts to try and rewrite what happened that day. Even for those who were there and experienced it and saw it with their own eyes. And that's particularly difficult to hear for many people that are still struggling with the trauma from what they saw that day. We don't have a very long memory for things these days, so um, I think right now I definitely live with the fear that this will easily happen again. I think my, my deepest hope is that this is not going to become a template uh, for anyone who comes after Donald Trump. What I don't want is for people to forget what happened that day or, or to make it any less than what it was. It was an appalling assault on democracy. Extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to.